Hello, um, good evening and welcome to the General Society. And you know, I feel like I've been saying this every Tuesday this winter, but thank you so much for coming out. And I really think that tonight might be the worst night, so you're all absolutely brilliant for being here this evening, so thank you very much. Um, I am Karen Taylor, and I'm a program director of the General Society of the Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York. Um, and I'm very pleased to welcome you this evening, and this is to the labor component of the Labor, Literature, and Landmark Lecture Series. Uh, the, these lectures, the Labor, Literature, and Landmark Lectures, are supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. The General Society uh, was a nonprofit organization that was founded in 1785. And you will find information on the history of the organization on a blue postcard on your chair. But this, this lecture is part of a really historic tradition because the first lecture held at the General Society in another building uh, was in 1837. And the space you are in tonight, of course, is the uh, General Society Library. Uh, the library was founded in 1820 and is now the second, is the second oldest library in the city. It's one of three remaining membership libraries with circulation. And I also want to mention to you, perhaps for any of you who this is your first visit, that you will find uh, membership information on the library on the table at the front beside Meg. Um, I also want to mention that this evening, after the talk, there will be a short wine and cheese reception that we hope you will stay for. Now, this is the third in a series of four labor lectures um, that we have been fortunate enough to partnership with United Scenic Artists 829. And these lectures provide a behind the scenes look at the creative industries in New York City. And the seri series is curated by Beverly Miller, um, who is the president of the local uh, USA, USA 829. But this evening, to introduce our speaker, Jeff Davis, I'm very pleased to say that we have the vice president from USA 829. So I, I, let me just tell you very quickly, and that is F. Mitchell uh, Dana. And uh, Mr. Dana has lit over 600 professional productions in addition to working as a technical director, head elect electrician and industrials and for television, head prop man and Broadway and on tour, stage manager and on and off Broadway. Some of his many Broadway lighting credits include The Suicide, Freedom of the City, Mass Appeal, Monday After the Miracle, Once in a Lifetime, Man and Superman, The Spectre General and O oh Coward. I'm very pleased to introduce to you uh, Mitch Dana. Thank you. Truly welcome for coming out on a night like this. So tonight we're going to be discussing theatrical lighting design and the speaker is my colleague and therefore uh, an experienced practitioner of the craft. A design of any kind is a plan to accomplish a goal. One can illuminate objects as one form of lighting, but our job is to illuminate ideas. We must use our paint, light, to help tell the story. We do this by manipulating light, not only to illuminate the stage interestingly, but by using light and shadow, contrast and harmony, shape and motion to evoke an emotional connection between the audience and what's going on on the stage. Our work is often not remarked upon or even noticed, which is as it should be because we are not there as headliners most of the time, but as the supportive and connective tissue in the fabric of the play. Like magic, the effect would be lost if the techniques were revealed. Tonight's speaker has spun this magic many times and in many venues and in many genres. He's worked extensively at this trade for almost 45 years, on Broadway and off for pre-Broadway productions and national tours in the regional theater world as the resident lighting designer for the New York City Opera in its old incarnation, uh, as well as in myri myriad other regional opera companies. He's worked on musicals, in plays, for opera, concerts, dance, for events and industrials, and last but not least, 
extensively in television. I give you the accomplished and uh, accomplished practitioner of the profession who, who blends technical acumen with extensive sensibilities, my friend and colleague, Jeff Davis. <laughs> Hi, again, thank you for coming out tonight. Um, I first want to thank, uh, say I'm absolutely honored to ha have the privilege to talk to you. There are many very, very talented and creative lighting designers in United Scenic Artists. And it, when Beverly asked me to do this, I said it was, I'm honored and very humbled to be chosen by my, my colleagues to be able to do this talk. Um, First, I'll talk a little bit about how, when lighting got started, how, what it is. Um, no one really n documented much of anything before the 1920s. Um, and it's still sort of hard to find documentation on it. Um, but back then, there were designers like Robert Evan Jones and um, Norman Bel uh, that would actually, who were scene designers, but basically did their own lighting. And they did it in such a way that they would try to explain to an electrician uh, stage electrician, how what they wanted it to do, like where they wanted the lights to go. And the electrician just went off and did it. And so instead of saying, like we do now, bring up channel 12 to 7, they'd say, turn on the blue backlight. They had no idea what the number was and they didn't care. Um, but then along the way, people started figuring out ways of doing things graphically. Uh, in 1921, Robert Evan Jones. Uh, took to adding, doing elevations of his work and actually putting where he thought light should go. And this is sort of the, uh, this is a Prussian Macbeth that he did in 1921. Um, and I don't know if it's to any scale, but if it were, you could take a ruler and actually hang the lights exactly where he drew them. Um, the next sort of, event that happened in trying to teach or document lighting was a, a book called A Method of Lighting the Stage, written by Stanley McCandless, who was teaching at Yale at the time. And he, he, he was the first, it was first, first textbook to actually try to explain uh, how to document and, and weight and manipulate light and intensity, color, and, and control. Uh, it was fairly, it explained how to mix color, and unfortunately, it was fairly simplistic in, you know, compared to what we do now. And, but it became sort of the, the general, it became so in, ensconced in academia over the years that it was sort of everyone referred to it as the method of lighting the stage, um, which meant there are many. Um, there have basically been three or four generations of lighting designers. The first generation who I feel were important to the industry are, are were, um, Obviously, Robert Evan Jones, who lit his own scenery, Joe Melziner, who lit his own scenery, Abe Fader, who lit for the stage on the Empire State Building, uh, Gene Rosenthal, and Peggy Clark. Uh, I did some research to find out when did people start acknowledging lighting designers on Broadway show programs, and found it wasn't really until 1934. And I'll just rattle off the shows that, that were did for Abe Fader. It was Four Saints in Three Acts, and that was 1934. Joe Melziner's first lighting credit was Boys from Syracuse in 1938. Robert Evan Jones, Philadelphia Story in 1939, and I thought he would have been the first one on the list. Uh, Gene Rosenthal did a play called Rosalinda in 1942. Ironically, the year before that, she was uh, a production supervisor for a production that Joe Melziner designed called Seventh Trumpet, and I think it lasted about three days. But um, And Peggy Clark's first was Baker's Opera, Ho Baker's Holiday, sorry. And those folks are really the ones that trained the second generation of designers that we all now know, uh, that include Theron Musser, Jules Fisher, Marty Ehrenstein, and Tom Skelton. And again, and those people then train other people, and on goes the, on go the generations of lighting design. The first Tony Award for lighting design, believe it or not, was not until 1970. Um, this is kind of how this went. I'll pretend I'm an announcer. The word for best scenic design for a play goes to Joe Melziner. Joe Melziner walked out on stage, 
thanked everybody, and then thanked the lighting designer for making his set look so good. He walked off the stage, had barely gotten off the stage, and the award for best lighting design of a play goes to Joe Melziner. Walked back on stage and said, thank you, I want to thank the set designer for giving me some really interesting things to light. <laughs> uh, so what is, I guess, start with what is light? Um, we, you know, we walk around in it all day. Uh, we feel safer in it than we do without it. Um, and in, the, in its purest form, it can only be seen when it hits something. And if you want to look at an example of that, we'd be looking at the moon on a clear night. Um, there's no atmosphere. There's, it's just a bright object lit by the sun. But most of the time, our Earth is shrouded in, in very, an atmosphere which is gas and pollution and whatever. And that is really what light filtering through that is what actually gives us all of our beautiful sunsets and sunrises. And in fact, when Mount St. Helena erupted numerous years ago, spewing ash into the stratosphere, it, um, actually the sunrises got much more attractive because um, more stuff in the air. Uh, light, light kind of affects how we react to something. We can walk around New York or wherever you live and see basically the same thing every day, but you don't really notice much about it. Um, for example, here's a, a picture of Central Park. This is actually from a wonderful book called Out My, New York Out My Window by a woman named Ruth Orkin. Uh, but you can see you, you know, that's one view of it, and that's another view of it. And you can decide to see it affects your mood and how you feel about something. Um, Lighting has always been part of other arts. Uh, you know, writers have always described light. It was a dark and stormy night, and there was lightning everywhere. Um, you can hear water motif. You can hear various motifs in in opera, not light motifs, but things that sound like something. Um, and then, um, but more importantly, it was lighting was best captured by painters. Um, as here is an example. Uh, this is a painting by Charles Hassam, who's an American artist. Um, what this does, it's the, first, the best way, really, to document, before photo photography happened, some captured scene. But unlike photography, the painters can kind of do whatever they want. They can sort of fudge the details a little bit. And in reality, that's kind of what we do in the theater. Because basically, in the theater, nothing's real. Um, you know, the sets aren't really houses, the woods aren't really woods, and things are done in perspective, so it looks bigger than it is. But what you learn from painting, and which is important, I think, as a, more important, mostly as a lighting designer, is understanding foreground, middle ground, and background, which is this being the foreground, that being middle ground, that being background. Um, and sometimes what is most important on stage does not have to be downstage. For example, at least for me, when I look at this painting, uh, the middle ground, this part, draws my attention before I see the subject who's actually sitting in the chair. So you can very easily, not everything in its highest visibility has to be downstage. Um, but I think the best things we can do as, design, as lighting designers is constantly study painting of various types. Um, and they, basically, painters understood that, that lighting is a tool, and basically light and shadow is how you tell your story. So, given that, what do I think is good lighting design? <clears throat> there are two things, lighting, there's lighting effect with an A, and there's lighting effect. Um, effect, effect, by definition, is to have influence on or edit or affect a change in, to act on, on the emotions of or to touch or move. And that's exactly what lighting does in the theater. It is subliminal, you can't see it, and, but we can, it, we can change it at will and hopefully you don't notice it. Lighting effects, on the other hand, are lightning flashes and things that are blatantly obvious. Um, and they're tricks. As Mitch said earlier, our job is to really illuminate the drama and tell the story visually. And the light designer with the other di design colleagues all tried to do that, the same thing. Um, and illum by illuminating the drama is different than lighting the stage. Lighting the stage is, well, the work lights are on. Um, lighting the drama is lighting design. <clears throat> lighting can move in time and space unnoticed. 
and characters from theater, and which is important because the characters in a play also move in time and space and evolve, and so must the lighting. Um, lighting, I believe, is the most powerful element of design in the theater. It can tell you where to look, it tells you where not to look, and in, in reality, it is cinematography for the theater. You can, you can light a show in such a way that you have the effect of dollying into a two scene, dollying out, tracking out of that. Um, we decide, lighting designers tell you, we, we decide what you are going to look at on stage and how you are going to see it. So, designing a play or a production. I'm going to be talking about was one particular play. Um, everything begins with the play. And then someone has decided we're going to do this play for some reason. <clears throat> so what I tend to do is you know, read the play through once, not thinking about its lighting or anything else. Just what's the, what is it? What's it about? What's the playwright trying to say? Then I'll go back and read it again and start being more specific and looking for things. And, and my theory is, too, that if the playwright Set it, if the playwright through the actors says it, you have to do it. Um, if they mention a time of day or something, you need to make it look like that. I was doing a production of Macbeth, um, the opera, and which had super titles. And since my Italian is not very good, uh, I depend on libra untranslated libretto for what the information I need. The translation in the score that I had said, in, a, in the plotting scene, the sun is setting. We got into tech rehearsals and the super title said, the sun has set. Those are two different situations all together. And when I couldn't get the super title person to change the super title, I said, okay, I guess I have to change the lighting. <laughs> um, so after you've read the play, then you go meet the director who has been hired by the producer and approved by the playwright. And theater is in a way is a very autocratic experience because it's not a free for all. The director is under the producer the most responsible person for getting the play on stage and getting to drive everybody else to try to communicate what the playwright wants to do and wants, wants to say with his play. Um, the next one in this sort of try, the sort of, you know, uh, food triangle is um, the scenic designer, because he's the one that actually is going to basically make the physical environment and, and, and pick everything the actors deal with. Um, then you get the costume designer involved in it, then you get the lighting designer involved in it. And we all listen to the director and what he wants to say about the play, and hopefully we all think the play means the same thing. Uh, if it doesn't, it's sort of a problem. It sort of, like my theory is that like if, Someone would come to me and say, I think we'd do, we should do glass menagerie as if it's in an aquarium. I think I'd quit because I don't understand it. Somebody else might be perfectly suitable for that job, but it's not me. Um, so then we get to the first thing the set designer brings in uh, to show with other things is a ground plan. And this is basically a scale drawing that shows looking down on them as if you're looking down on a set from above, and it's done to scale, and you can figure out how, figure, basically you can look at it and say, okay, I have six feet of space to do this in, um, such as like here to there, and, no one, and sometimes the director will say, well, I need more than that, so then you redesign the set. Um, but you get that. Then the next thing you get is, usually, is a model. This, this is um, a production of Don Giovanni that was, designed by Joe Malziner, uh, I built the model, um, and it was done for the Metropolitan Opera, but it got canceled, it was never done. Uh, but it's very nice, it tells you, tells the director, really, you can see physically where the spatial relationships are and everything else, and, I, and he, if you can't really understand the ground plan, that'll kind of tell him something physical reality you can actually deal with. The problem is, it doesn't tell me as a lighting designer anything. I have no idea from looking at this, how the set designer has any, in, any way of telling me what he wants his set looked like under a condition of stage lighting. So in the old days, accompanying this, would come a sketch of the same, 
of the same set. Now I know looking at that exactly how to light it. I know what color to make it. I know what intensity to make it. I know everything about it from looking at this. I could recreate that on stage easily. But okay, so, but people don't do these much anymore. It's basically models. And so how to talk to a director about lighting, which is something you can't see really and you, until when you can't really touch it. So people have tried various things and they've tried uh, oh, doing, looking at photographs and research and you know this sort of thing, paintings. Um, this is something that I actually showed a director, believe it or not, from, this is my sort of visual response, if you call it, to Diary of Anne Frank. Um, just a feeling, now that could tell the director what my feeling is about it. Uh, a more obvious one is that, which is actually very, you know, this is what a research thing for a, a play I called Musical Comedy Murders. And as you can see, the thing that's really brilliant about the way it's, the way it's lit, this thing on, is that you can really see the angles of the lights, are, the way this is lit, it out, is very believable. And the shadows all fall in the right place. It's not really lit by the candle, but all these very specifically tight lights are actually rep reproducing it. Um, and that is, you know, that's still useful, but it still doesn't really say anything to about the play that we're doing. And so I had feel, felt that somebody has to draw something before you get into the theater. I mean, it's not, then you sort of get into the thing where, is that what it's really gonna look like? You know, uh, well, if, it's better if you've been able to show something. So um, this is from my method of design. Now, but now we can sort of the things that I wanna say that this is what I do. And every other light designer uh, approaches things of how they communicate totally differently and how they go through their process. This happens to be mine. And I'm not the only one that does this, I'm sure. Um, but uh, I started doing lighting, light travels in straight lines. So it's very easy to sketch. And so I started doing uh, lighting sketches. Uh, here we have one. Um, it's a play of crime and punishment. And it's a uh, unit set which means that it sits there and the lighting moves, all, moves around and tells you where you're actually supposed, where, you, where your location is. Um, and then under that, then you get, and, and you, as you will see, it's pretty close to what the actual photograph of the show was. Um, then the next thing that actually I started doing was what I would call a lighting storyboard, which is an idea that was ripped off from the advertising world of how they sketch out shots for advertising. Uh, and so this then becomes, that is the storyboard for, for crime and punishment. Um, and it basically shows every major, every major so I say composition or look in the show is not every cue. But as you can see in this, the lighting was really there primarily to define space and to tell you where you were, because the set didn't. <laughs> um, and we get you, and theater is getting more and more of this kind of production because the right, people are writing movie scripts. And so the only way you can do it really is to do minimal scenery with a lot of lighting support. Um, um, I, did these, I did these for a long time. I stopped doing them for a while because I would take them to directors and they would look and say, now do I have to put the people where you drew them? <laughs> no, you can put them wherever you want to. And they were still so intimidated by it. And it sort of, I, I found for a while it was turning them off. And I said, well, okay, I'll go back to, you know, funny research pictures for a while. Um, and they're in black and white because um, to me, quality and angle of light is the most important detail that tells you the story. Um, when you go outside in the daytime and you look at your shadow on the ground from the sun, you know it's 10 o'clock because you're used to seeing your shadow being a certain length on the ground. And that's how we tell what's happened. That's the fact that it's, you know, that it has green grass and isn't really the issue. At the same token, color is decided by other people, mainly the set designer and the costume designer. And my job is to basically 
unify all of that together and still take their color, take their patterns, and with my lighting, trying to do what I want to accomplish within that, make sure I'm making what they drew looks like what they drew. There's a, uh, a root, uh, sort of a tale that goes around of Boris Aronson, who was a very famous American designer. And, um, and he um, was from, immigrated from Russia in the 20s. And for some reason or other, he never caught on to American speak. So he, said, he always sounded like he just got off a boat at Ellis Island. And he was heard to say to some lighting designer once, if I wanted it that color, I would have painted it that color. <clears throat> so color can help the composition, but it can't make a composition. Another reason color is so, to me, not as important is that if I say to, to all of you, blue, every one of you will have a different idea of what blue is. I was doing a, a show, a, a production of Christmas Carol one year, and we had a night scene, and the director kept saying, it's, too blue. it's not blue enough, it's not blue enough. And I kept making it bluer, making it bluer for a couple of days. And finally, I couldn't get it any bluer. And I was just getting frustrated. And at one point, the assistant, the assistant director leaned over to me and said, you know he's colorblind, don't you? Uh, <laughs> thanks for the warning. Okay, um, let's see what we have left in here. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about a specific show, Street Scene. Uh, a little bit about it, it was a play. It was made, uh, written by Elmer Rice in 1929, um, which was then later made into a musical uh, in 1946 by Kurt Vile and Elmer Rice, the writer, and Langston Hughes. The set, as described, is a uh, exterior uh, of a walk-up apartment of a house in the mean quarter of New York, which at that point was West Side, and is made of ugly brownstone. And Joe Malziner designed the original set for this, and it's excruciatingly realistic, and that's exactly what they wanted. And pretty much any time anyone's done this, they pretty much stuck to that. And it was an interesting new concept for theater because it, it was... An, a, an apartment house of which many families lived in. So in terms of dramatic structure, it had many simultaneous and overlapping scenes between these parties and that would seem to be, from what I read, that was sort of a, a novel way of doing a play back then. No one had ever done that before. Um, so in doing that, um, what's next here on this thing? Oh, okay, go back. So the next, so what, do, what does one get from to design a play. You've read the play, you've talked about it, we know what we're going to do with it. So what happens? Uh, the first thing you get um, is a ground plan, which is what the set designer has drawn here, uh, which is a down view. You'd also get a what we call a section, which is, in this case, it is looking from stage left to stage right. This tells you basically how, you know, how tall the set is, and also many other d design drawings go into this, but this is just the first two things you look at. And so the other important drawing, which you don't get, at least I find I find necessary to use, is, is a front elevation, which one has, they don't usually give you one, so you have to sort of concoct it from all of the design building drawings that you get that they would send to the scene shop. And you get, oh, I got these out of order, I think. Oh, sorry about that. Let's see, oh, th there we go. Um, that. Um, so that is the front elevation. And, and that, is not in, that is not in perspective. It is literally a measurement thing of just, if you line the setup and smash it against the wall, that's actually what it looks like in its two dimensions. So the next thing you have to do, once you do that, is figure out where in the ground plan you want to put your light pipes, which is there. Um, I, you find that from looking at the ground plan and the section and you figure, okay, we have to get them high enough so people don't see them. And we have to make sure that, and you can push, and most theaters, you can put them wherever you want to. So we have to sort of have some idea of what you're going to do with them and what you're gonna hang on them when you put them there. Um, so, and that shows the position, the, the 
height of the physicians, there's one. You see this, this line coming here is a sight line uh, from the audience's point, first row of the audience. And so you wanna make sure that the light isn't any lower than that to keep it out of, out of, the, out of the plane of the, of the, of the, of the set, um, for the most part. Uh, okay, now we're back to the front elevation. Now, the next thing one does, once you figure out your lighting positions and all that, the next thing I would do then is a sketch. And we have one here, um, which takes place at um, two in the afternoon. And what is important to me is that is the shadows. Oh, sorry, back, it's not the, that's the other button. Um, is that you see the, the line of the shadows, which is what tells you the time of day. And the fact that they're all parallel, which is what they would be. And that, and so to me, the most information you're getting is from shadow, not from light. And um, now to do that, you do the painting, then you go back to the elevation that you have done and start putting lights in places. Now where, in reality, since this is in scale, you have found the height of the light pipes from the section. And so this line up here is actually the light pipe. And here is the, basically the lens of the unit. And so you figure out that you just pick an arbitrary, not arbitrary angle, it's two o'clock in the afternoon. I think that's what that looks like. And so I start plotting where lights go to, cre to create the scenery. That particular plan is lighting the wall of the, the, of the huge set. You would do probably have more lights downstage of that to light actors, and you, but they would keep the same angle because if you're trying to say this is the same time of day, all the shadows have to be the same length. So you figure out where, where in all this theater can you put lights to get the angle you want. Um, so back up one more time. Here we have the sketch. Here's the front elevation. And there's the photograph of it on stage. And as you can see, the important thing that I think is important is that the shadows are all linear. They're all parallel to each other. And that is because I picked the angles of lights are parallel to each other. And to me, in a realistic play, that's very important. Um, and you, you then go through, like I did with the storyboard, every scene in the show and storyboard it. This is sometime in the middle of, in the middle of the night and there's its photograph. Now you'll notice that in my sketch, I have the main scene hanging out underneath the street light. Well, clearly the director didn't like that. So, and as you can see, the source of the light's coming down on her. And so the director moved him. So no big deal. You just say, okay, if street light if street light, light comes down, it also does that and illuminates them. So you do a whole nother bunch of drawings and say, okay, here's the street light. If you stand under it, it's straight down light. Then it gets progressively shallower as it goes across the stage. And so once you get the look of it, they can go anywhere they want and still be motivated and look like it's lit by the brightest street light in the world. Um, <laughs> okay, now what happens after that is we do a thing called a light plot, which is exactly what it says. It shows you where every lighting position is, which I've already decided. Now it tells me where, I, where the lights go. Now, if you remember back to the front elevation, each one of those arrows was a light. So you do that for one scene, then you do it for another scene, and then you do it for another scene, and you keep doing it, and then you end up with that. And every light has its own personality, every, every light has its own, I think personality is the right thing to say. It has its own personality, it has its own color, it has its own purpose in life, and that's what it's going to do. And it's very happy, because he knows what he's going to do. Um, and every light, so every light has information that travels with it in its paperwork. It has its color, the control channel it's plugged into, the dimmer it, that is plugged into, and anything else that travels with it. Um, and there's a section view. Uh, this, to, to tell you what's, what is going on here, this, this 
lighting position, which is drawn as if it's lying down, so you can see what it is, is actually that. But so we're doing graphics to try to make it easy for the electricians to understand it. And also it's very detailed, it's very, everything is dimensioned. Uh, so they know exactly how far one light from the other is. And we all decide that for many reasons, usually. And because it's really our, our job to make sure that, that you know your show well enough, you spend enough time drawing it, you go in and you can focus it and not have a sudden say, oh, we have to move this thing because it doesn't work. That's just time. Um, so accompanying this is, now we get into, now we get into the technical nitty gritty. Oh, that, this is the second thing. This is uh, what I call a practical plot because the uh, apartment building in what street scene is realistic. That obviously means that they, they really have real rooms in it on the second and third floor. And so, which were decorated and they had wallpaper and chairs and all that, but they also had to have lamps. So this, these two drawings show the second and third, the first and second floor of the building of where all the lamps go in the room. And because, okay, the people, they don't go to the extreme usually of putting wall sockets in, but they need to know where they run the cable through all, how they got the cable through all this scenery. Um, and that's the electrician's job. Um, then comes some more paperwork. <clears throat> um, years ago, a gentleman named John McKernan invented this version of doing lighting paperwork, which is basically a very specific Excel file for lighting. And it, in its columns, it tells you everything you need to know about each light. Um, but its beauty is it can be sorted any way you want to sort it. So it can, this is, say, so this, say, is a channel hookup, uh, which, in, which basically says, okay, if I, want some, if I want dimmer 42 to come on, that's what's in it. And it'll tell me where, and this tells me, here it tells me where it focuses, what color it is, what the type of light is, and this tells you where it's located on the light plot. Now, you could also sh look this up another way. I want to see what's only on one lighting position. Well, then you do this, which is called an instrument schedule. And this would be all the units that are on the second term right, which is a position. This is basically how, what the lights are plugged into to make them work. And, and they're, they're dimmers, and there can be, on a Broadway show now, there can be you know, four or 500 of them. Um, the other thing that, uh, that one has to do um, is this little thing tells you, it'll sort by unit type and how many there are. Uh, this one is a thing that's very useful if you go work in someone else's theater. It tells you, you know, how many things they have of every variety. And then when you draw the show and you realize you've drawn 10 more than they have, uh, then you have to go say, will they rent them or not? Uh, this, th this piece sorts color and tells you how many cuts of color to put for each light. This used to be an extraordinarily tedious experience uh, when you were doing this all by hand, which I was when I first moved here. Um, okay, so get back to the minute. So what happens in this thing? You get all the paperwork together, and there are two kinds of productions that happen. One is theaters with their own equipment, which are most regional theaters in the country. And then there's Broadway, which doesn't have a thing in it. Uh, you walk into a Broadway theater with no show there, it's a box. It's a, it's a box with one side missing. And so therefore, anything that comes into the theater has to be, it, you need for the show has to be brought by the production. Every piece of cable, every piece of wood, every piece of pipe, every light, uh, which is all detailed, documented in these drawings for lighting. They, the, the electricians for the show go out in, the, in a shop and they prepare all of this gear, pack it in a proper way so they can figure out what it is when it shows up in the theater and then suddenly two semis full of lighting equipment show up in boxes and they begin hanging the show. Um, at the same time that's going on, they're building scenery, and the show's in rehearsal. Um, but Broadway's an odd duck because most places you don't have to worry about, you don't have to really do a shop order, which is an equipment list, specifying every piece of pipe, every piece of hardware, every kind of light, what kind of lens it has in it, and it just, you know, it's endless. Um, and that then produces, and what happens, then you will send that order to 
lighting shops around the city for bids. And the producers, of course, will go to the lowest bidder. Uh, but th to give you an idea of a current, like an average Broadway musical now, the rent weekly rental cost for lighting equipment is about $27,000 a week. Um, so you go in, they hang the lights, and they usually do that because they're above everything else. Then you load in the scenery <coughs> under that. And um, while that's going on, you watch run-throughs of the show and take notes of what you, you know from the sketches, what you want it to look like. And now it's all about moving the light in that particular composition to where the actors go. And, and of course, as I said, they don't necessarily put them where you drew them in your little sketch, but so you say it still has to look like two o'clock, but we'll move the light around to where they are. And you watch it and you take copious notes and figure out where the light cues are. Now light cues are what, what one, does a light cue, well, is an exercise that basically makes the light change. And in, um, and in, um, in, in theater, the person that really deals with this is the stage manager. And it's obvious she is called the stage manager or she, he because they manage the stage. They call, they have enormous, enormous books and they call light cues, scenery, automation cues, projection cues, sound cues, Nothing happens on stage without them saying the G-O word. And um, so you, you watch the thing and you, know, you watch the rehearsals, you make your notes, and now these are two versions of things you can do that, we, that I would give a stage manager. The first one, second one, the stage left one is um, clearly a piece of music. And in opera or in music, the cues are notated by this, the, by the system, which is that, and then the measure, which are these bars, so and the page number. So this, for example, is on uh, system three, bar two, and that's how you describe where the, where the cue actually goes uh, in music. This other side is sometimes people that do musicals don't want to call it, don't want to call it from music, and uh, so they'll call it from the, from the libretto. And the illustration on the side is a fairly, as you can say, a fairly complicated cue-wise musical number. And, uh, but I, again, I've indicated the tick marks and things where exactly the cue gets called. For example, here it's at the beginning of this line. Back here it's at the end of, there's a slash that says at the end of Roland. It's Rolling Down the Rivers, this song, by the way. Um, and, so that's, then you get into tech. You know, the loading's gone on for five weeks or something, and now you know, you've focused your lights, and now you sit down to write Q1. And unlike uh, scenery and costume designers who can sit there and do all their art and create nice pictures in their apartment, lighting designers do it in front of everybody. And, and it's, I, I've never, as long as I've been doing this, I don't think writing Q1 is panic stricken because everybody's waiting for you to do it and they're all sitting there while you try to turn you know enormous amount of lights on and off and you know you you might sit there with a little storyboard and say okay this is what I meant to do or you have something to do and you know exactly what you're going to turn on first because you've already figured it out but it takes a lot of time and then people sometimes directors will say oh I don't like yellow well, it's not going to be yellow when I'm done with it when I mix another color with it. It won't be yellow. Shut up, you know. Um, if you're lucky, you can do the lighting cues when they're not there. <laughs> you know? If you're lucky, you, you can get them done in the morning and uh, hopefully, you know, they want to how they did it. Um, so that goes on. You get the show lit and you rehearse it a couple of times and then it opens. Uh, previews in regional theaters and Broadway. Opera, not so much. Opera, uh, you almost always are going to see it run for the first time in front of 11, in, in, in front of like 8,000 of your dearest friends. Because they put them together so quickly that you might not have ever run through the entire show before you actually do the opening. And they don't do previews. You don't know what the audience response is. You don't know anything about it. It's just, well, it's the, you know, three people that were sitting in the theater with these people. Um, well, we'll, we'll laugh at it if we can. Um, 
And there you go. And then the show's run, and as long as the show's run. Uh, a little touch of technology. Um, I won't get into technology particularly, but except the major things that have changed our lives drastically. Uh, before 1976, um, shows were run by manual dimmers, which means if anyone remembers back to high school with those, those handles on walls that turned lights in the theater on and off, um, those were dimmers. And in the same way on, 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 any place, on any place else, you had numerous ones of these that numerous stagehands ran from reading cue sheets. And it was tedious and it was, it kind of limited what you had, what you could do with them. And then the lighting computer board became invented and um, was brought to Broadway by Theron Musser for a chorus line. And an interesting story was they had done it down with the public with um, a computerized light board. And they, she said, it can't be done on manual boards. And they said, oh, we can do anything. So they, apparently they went up to the lighting shop, uh, set up six dimmer boards that guys would run, and they played a tape of the stage manager calling the show. They run out cue, wrote cues for them, stage manager called it the way it, the show ran, and they said, we can't go that fast. So the computer board was let on Broadway. Um, the other thing that has helped miserably is automated lighting equipment. And, and there are a myriad varieties of these. And the beauty of them is, is when they move by computer control, they can change their beam shape, they can change their color, they can change, uh, they can be soft edged or hard edged or you can put patterns in them. Um, so for example, if you wanted on one, on one part of the stage a, a, a blue light, a pink light, a yellow light, and a green light, you'd have to hang five of those. One light will do that for you. And what we have found is, here is a plot of a production I did of Madame Butterfly at um, Indianapolis Opera. I, ironically, I've done the show twice on the same set. So this was the plot with conventional equipment. Now it would take about six hours to hang the lighting equipment. Then you put the set underneath it, which takes another five or six hours. Then you have to focus all of this. And the average people say is, you know, two minutes of light. So you're doing down to another six hours before people can even get on stage and do anything. So what I found over the years was that uh, if I did the entire overhead rig with moving lights, it would do the same thing that all of those lights did the light plot looked like that. And, and what is also interesting is that the, they make programs, that the computer programs that run these lights also have what they call offline editors. So one can actually, if you, if you like me, are as specific as, you, as I am about where every light points and what it does, I can actually go into a computer and actually preset all of the move, all the positions that these lights have before we even get into the theater. And so, in the course of this, we have found that we we saved eight hours of time, and probably saved over. People, they, I estimated thirty eight hundred dollars in crew time, but I think that it's more. They said no, it's much more than that. Counting benefits, it's probably like fifty eight, fifty nine hundred dollars. So it. You know, it's a cost saver, and it gets you better production. And, to, but to going back to where I started, all of these things are figured out, even though it's automated, it's figured out the same way I would do with every single light that I showed you in, in Street Scene. Everything has its purpose, and it has its reason for being. And in this case, it's you do the same thing, scene by scene, and say, well, I was gonna use this light, this, say I was gonna use, sorry, I'm gonna drive this thing. <laughs> oh, yeah, anyway, that's terrible. What did I do to this? Suddenly it's going backwards. How does, how, how does that happen? How does that happen? How is it going backwards? Oh, there, that's weird. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so if I were going to use, like, suppose I'll say, okay, I'll do a scene, I'll say the four lights on the wall are this, 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 and this. 
Now, okay, they're going to that angle, works great. Now I need, no, but now I need one to do something else. So do I add another light? Do I, no, I can rejugger this around and figure out how to do it with what I have. Um, I was actually asked, that's sort of about all I know about lighting. Um, I was asked to uh, say a little bit about how I got into this racket. Um, and uh, pretty much everybody else, I, went, I grew up in Philadelphia and had the great advantage of watching many, many Broadway tryouts. And some of them were just horrific. And, uh, and they were fantastic to watch. I mean, it was, you know, it's, it's sort of like watching a bus rack. And you, and, and you kind of realize how fun it is until you grow up and you're doing one of your own. Um, but I did get to see a lot of good shows, too. Um, I went to Northwestern, which has a, has, I think it still does, has a, a fabulously active theater program. Um, Lighting was not particularly, in, no one was very interested in lighting back then. And so if you were interested in the lighting, you got to light all sorts of stuff. And I must have lit 40 shows while I was there. If someone's light, doing something, I'll go light it. It's fine. Because that's how you learn. You, can't, you can only do so much paper project in a class. You have to go eventually go turn lights on and see what it does. Uh, while there, in my senior year, I said, I always wanted to work on Broadway. So I'm going to make that happen. So I wrote letters to every designer, lighting designer in New York, I could find their address for, and send it off, and I said, well, I'll go for spring break, and then I can interview all these people. Well, the only people that wrote me back were, believe it or not, Joe Melziner, Theron Musser, and Jules Fisher, the three eminent designers of the time. And I thought, well, man, you are hot stuff. And so I go and I interview and met them all and it was all very nice and then I went back to, back to school and in reality I was gonna go to uh, Yale uh, after school and do more scenery work because I really wanted to do scenery and lighting. And, um, but one summer day, I'm in my, living in Philadelphia with my parents doing drafting for an architect and um, phone rings and this woman says, Hi, this is Theron Musser. And I went, yeah, I'm Jesus Christ too. How are you? <laughs> no, it's really Theron. And I couldn't. I started recognizing her voice. I interviewed her, and I went, oh my lord, that was horrible. Um, and she basically said, would you want it? Do you want a job? And now here's something I thought. If I, I thought I had met all the, the, I had met her. I said, I can die now. Okay, go work for her. Yeah, I can be up in about three hours. No, it's not that important, you know. And so I got hired. But. She hired me, and then when she hung up the phone, she just said, well, have a nice afternoon, Jesus. Um, <clears throat> um, so um, I worked for Theron Musser for a year and a half. And then out of the blue, I had interviewed with Melziner a year before, and out of the blue, I get this phone call. Hi, this is Joe Melziner's office. Would you come up and talk to Mr. Melziner? Sure. So I came up and, ended, and I got hired to assist him primarily the first two the ori original project was going to be working on the Met Giovanni but he also had a show that was not doing particularly well in Washington called Outcry and so I was sort of shipped down there to sort of clean up the lighting because Joe was a good artist he was not good at paperwork and the electricians were getting cranky and uh, so I went down to fix that up it came to New York and closed in about four days um, but so then when Mr. Melziner died, I ended up with nothing to do, and I was kind of rescued in a way by a friend of mine who I'd met, a friend of my family's actually, who was the head lighting director at NBC, and he was doing the Johnny Carson show and all sorts of other big things there. And he said, would you like to come and work with me at NBC for the summer and go down to the Miss America pageant? Sure. So that's how I learned about television. And so, with intent, so I did about 10 years of assisting and various people. Um, and through that, was able to get design jobs. I mean, you sort of design anything. Someone's doing a show in a basement, yeah, go do it. And you meet people, and you meet people your own age. I was, when I was assisting people, uh, assisting various designers, there'd always be an assistant set designer and assistant costume designer. And so you hung out with them, and if they got a job and you were friendly, they'd drag you along with them. And, 
And so that's kind of how that worked and how I got into the business. And But I must say, the biggest component of this is luck. You can be, when I, all the things I've done, I say, I'm not probably the best person to do this job. I can do it. But there's probably somebody better that they don't know about or didn't walk through the door at the right time. But I think you have to be well-trained and educated, but I also think that luck is probably 75% of whether you have a career in the theater or not. Um, um, I was also asked to sort of say something about to young line designers. What, what like, uh, young lighting designer advice can I give? Well, study art, uh, study painting. Uh, you learn more about composition uh, from that than doing anything else. Light anything you can, even if it's somebody's bathroom. You still have to make a choice about what, you, what kind of gear you put in it and what kind of quality of light you want. Go see shows. See what other people are doing. You'll get all kinds of ideas. And you'll get ideas of things you don't want to do. Well, I don't like that. That's not, my, that's not my aesthetic. You'll develop an aesthetic of your own, of things that you like. Um, you can, uh, if you're in any place where people are producing shows, go, go find the lighting designer and say, can I hang out with you? Because, and they'll always I might say yes, because in reality, we all did that. We all came to New York and watched other people work and when we were young and watch how other assistants work. And the real only thing is play with people your own age. Because just because you worked for a hot designer, you're not, you're not gonna be the one they call when that designer turns it down. They'll go to the next big wig in the Rolodex. So you'll get your jobs through the people that you, that you are you know, in, in the same generation. And, and you'll develop your own group of people that work all over the place all the time. And that's about all I have to say. I mean, I'm glad to entertain any questions anybody has. If any. Oh. The, what, is it, what has it been like to see uh, technology change um, over the course of your career? And how much, how much research do you do on the technology when you're looking at your designs versus giving that maybe to the role of your associate or an assistant to kind of keep you in the loop with different technologies um, that are, you know, saving on maybe load in yeah. time? And giving you more versatility, but still all of those pieces needing, you know, as you said, purpose. Well, I think, um, as I said, I think the most amazing thing that's happened to this industry was the computerized lighting control. Uh, that changed everything forever. Uh, because now, if you can't, there are so many ways you can run like you. You can have simultaneous things happening at the same time. So my theory is if your show doesn't look good, it's because you're not a good designer. I mean, it's, the light board can do anything you want it to do. Um, part of if you get to a certain age, like I am, you, you end up working in theaters with union stagehands. So we are really not allowed to touch anything. So I don't really have any idea how to run an ion board. I mean, I know how to talk to it. I can run the offline editor part of it on my laptop, but I have no idea. If I'd sat me down at one of these things, I wouldn't really have an idea how to, I mean, I could figure it out, but it would take me an awful long time and I'd be really terrible at it. Uh, but I think that uh, the, the, the other part of technology is all of this automated equipment that you can plug into it. I think that, I fear sometimes in watching some Broadway shows that, um, you know, you look at them and there doesn't seem to be any logic to the beams of light in the air or what is actually happening. And so sometimes you get the sense that they just, you know, we'll put in a bunch of stuff up here and we'll figure it out in the theater, um, which is not the right way to do it. Um, and, I, and a lot of times I think some of the shows get overloaded because they can and they have the money. Um, in terms of learning about the equipment, I don't know anything about how it works and I don't really care. But what I do make myself do, and I enjoy doing, is finding uh, in the various rental shops around the country, 
what do they have? And what will solve my problem? Uh, for example, there's a company called Verilite, which is probably the most predominant one. It's in New, York, in New York City and on the West Coast. There's another company called Martin that exists almost entirely in the middle of the, of the, middle of the country. So you might say, gee, I'd really like to have a, ver a Verilite, but well, we don't have that. So you find the next thing that you'd like. But I'm very interested in seeing how they color mix. Will it make the colors I want it to do? Some, will, some lights will make beautiful tint colors. Others, not a chance in hell. So, and you can't read that from a spec sheet. You gotta go to the shop and have them turn it on for you and make it do what you think you want it to do in your show. So it's always, again, it's always about picking the right equipment to do the right job. Does that answer your question, sort of? Or, uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, it's, it's, what is interesting to me is uh, a lot of the theater programs around the country are having a lot more of an emphasis on the technology. And so it seems to be in that sort of fifth, fifth or sixth generation of lighting designers, assistants, uh, to make yourself more marketable, you obviously have made a career as an LD, but many people want to make a career as an ALD or as a programmer. And so how do you, you know, how do you stay one step ahead where the technology is changing so quickly? And just in 10 years time, you know, you, LEDs were hardly a thing and now they're so much of a thing. Um, in what we do, so it's, well, just, it's just fascinating to hear. Uh, well, it is because they come, I mean, they, these people make these things, and suddenly they're like eight or nine companies making the same thing, and to various degrees of success. And I think that, I mean, we never know, you know, what's gonna come out until it suddenly shows up in a trade magazine or in some rental shop, and the rental shop comes, hey, come look at our new gizmo that we just got. Um, but it's important, to, it's very important to know what you want the light to do, and make sure it will do what, they, what you need it to do. Reading the spec, they'll tell you it'll, it'll you know, fly to the moon, but not necessarily. And so you just have to really know the equipment. Now, if you're gonna be a programmer, or saying, then that's a whole other bag. You might, I know a lot of people that have actually started out as lighting designers and became automated light programmers. They are really great automated programmers because they know what lighting designers do and because they've been there. And, and, it's, and it's, you know, 10 years ago, that wasn't really a career. I mean, uh, but now it is. And then you add, you know, projection design and all that onto it now. It's, these things are just sort of emerging from because they exist. Uh, how, how long do you work on a particular project and once the project is done, let's say Broadway project, uh, do you ever revisit the theater again to see if they're doing what you want them to do? Um, good question. I it probably, it, if I were doing a play, I think, it probably takes me about, from the time I start drawing to the time I have all the paperwork done, it probably takes me 40 or 50 hours. Um, I mean, that doesn't count reading it and mulling it around in your head for three days. And uh, once I actually sit down to the drafting board, it probably takes me 40, 50 hours. Um, and the second part is once it, it's in the theater, um, sometimes the show, some of the shows I've done haven't run long enough to go see them a second time, period. Um, I mean, um, but if it does run, uh, it is important to go because it's live theater. And as a play progresses, or as a musical progresses, or opera progresses, the rhythm of it is going to change. And it could change as cast settle into the show, it could change if they have a cast replacement, and then suddenly the lighting that is involving the actor doesn't necessarily work with what they're doing anymore. So it's important to go look at it and say, well, I need to make that a shorter count. They're getting, if it's following, if the lighting is following the actor from the bar to the couch, and suddenly they get there sooner or later, then the lighting doesn't time out with what they're doing. And because theater's live, it's gonna change every night. It's gonna be different. Uh, I, I will like, I will time just go myself. I, I was doing um, a production at City Opera. There was a musical director who was fabulous and was a lot of Broadway shows, Paul Gimignani. And he, he did all the Sondheim shows. And he was doing a show at City Opera. And they always did their musicals for like three or four weeks at the end of the season, just to make money. And 
They weren't in repertory. They ran sort of like an obviously Broadway show schedule. And he actually called, the, he had the stage manager call me up one day and say, um, you should come down and take a look, look at this. You know, Paul wants you to think something's weird for lighting. And I went down. And why he's a good musical director, he doesn't just do this. He's constantly looking at the stage. He's the only one that's really in charge that pays attention to everything. And true enough, the tempi of part of a dance number had settled in and changed. And the lights weren't really working with the tempo of the song. And so it's simple to fix. But, and maybe nobody would notice it. Maybe the average person wouldn't notice it. But you look at it and something's just kind of wanky and you can't quite figure out what it is. But, I, you know, I, I do go back and look at things. And of course, if, I, if you have operas running in repertory, um, every time Carmen comes back every year, or Butterfly, it's always different. I mean, there's a huge sunrise scene in, uh, that is all lighting in, in the third act of Madame Butterfly. And I've done it, there are certain points in the music, things have to happen, like in the orchestration, you hear birds and then you hear something. So you know what time of day you're really in as the sun rises. But I have never ever done that, I've never been able to take the cues from one production and that score and use them again. Because it depends how they conduct it, what the speed of it is, what you hear in the orchestration, and it's all gut. And I've never done it the same way twice. Hi. Um, were you uh, a little bored with TV compared to theater? Or what do you think the difference is between the two? Uh, the first difference is money <laughs> and what they pay you. Um, but I think it, what, where I got bored in television is, I liked it for about a year. I did, I, first soap opera I did was One Life to Live. And it, it is really like a factory job. I mean, you go in and light seven sets a day, and they, they rehearse till, you might go in at three o'clock in the morning, and you get out at seven o'clock at night. And you do this every other day with a partner who, you know, does the day you don't. And after a while, they, you kind of say, this is like the same old thing, day after day after day. And I'm glad I did it, but it, I, I just said, this isn't for me. This is, I'm not gonna do this one thing for the rest of my life. Whereas if you're a freelance designer, you know, you get numerous projects a year. And no matter how ugly they may be, you know at least it's going to end at some point. <laughs> um, and, but I don't mind going back and doing those kind of things, uh, you know, for like, I, I did a lot of vacation relief at ABC, so I'd go and do somebody's soap opera for three weeks or something. And that was just enough to, okay, done that, gotta leave again. Did it lead to connections, like you guys were talking about connections before? Uh, other uh, people who led you into other? Uh, oh, I did a lot of- Endeavors? <laughs> You get jobs from the strangest places. Um, I came home, was doing a show at Paper Mill Playhouse. I came home one night and there was a message on my machine. And I used to be, a, I, believe it or not, I used to be a figure skater. Um, and so I have a lot of figure skating friends. And some of them gone to teach, to be television directors for television and whatnot. And I came home one night and I got this phone call and say, hi, this is Meg Streeter. Is this the Jeff Davids that used to skate and does lighting? Yeah, yeah, so I called her back, said, what's up? So we're doing this special with Katerina Vitt and Brian Boitano. Do you want to do it? <laughs> do I want to do it? You know. Um, and so that's how I got that job. And the director, television director of that job was a man named Doug Wilson, who, who you all would know his name. He was the primary director of Wide World of Sports for years. And... Um, so we did that, and then there were a couple other specials ABC was going to do, and he was going to direct them. And so he took me along to all of these skating specials. And I wouldn't have done any of that if, if Meg Streeter hadn't thought of me. How do you look for when you're when you're looking for an assistant or an associate? Um, what do you look for, for um, in them that 
you want to hire them? Like, what, what do you want them to do? Like, what is the role of an assistant associate to you? Good question. That, it depends on the designer, um, totally. Um, for, for me, first of all, um, they have to be fun. <laughs> you spend more time, in a, when we're working in a tech on a show, you're in the theater from 8 o'clock till midnight. And if you're busy and you're doing show after show after show, you're going to spend more time with your assistant than you are your wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, or your dog. And so you'd better get along well. And you have to have two meals a day with this person. So they'd better be entertaining and be able to talk about something other than the show that you're working on. Um, um, in my particular case, I do all the layout of the shows. And, my, and I do it on paper on a drafting board. And my associate does then puts it into the computer form of it. Um, some designers are perfectly willing to, you know, well, they book themselves so difficultly that you know, they have to leave assistants to help light the shows because they're off doing something else. Um, I don't like doing that. I figured if they wanted someone else to light it and so to me, they should have, if they wanted my assistant to light it, they would have hired my assistant. Um, I've done a couple projects for, there are a couple of Broadway shows I've done that um, the designer never saw. Um, and I, you know, I was calling myself Fred Casper, the friendly ghost designer. And, um, and when one of the shows, the designer got a Tony nomination for a show that he didn't have anything to do with, really, I said, time to quit doing this. <laughs> um, but it really depends on, you know, on how, um, I think, how the designer wants it, what, he, what the designer needs. I'm pretty self-sufficient. Um, you know, when I was assisting Theron, you know, you would have to do manual track sheets and follow the script and do follow spot cues and all that sort of thing. And you did it all by yourself. Now there might be three people doing it. Um, so it, it, it really depends. Um, I think I've always been good with just having one person and maybe if it's a big show, I have one person dealing with me and the lights and someone else dealing with follow spots. And that's usually what happens because you can't be queuing the show and doing the follow spots at the same time because there's, there's too much going on. Mm. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. So, Jeff, um, on behalf of the General Society, I want to thank you so much. It was, it was comprehensive, it was detailed, and it was literally illuminating. So, I think <laughs> 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 so uh, we, are, we are so grateful for you to sharing your expertise, and we would like to acknowledge your contribution. This is Victoria Dengel, our executive hello. director. Hello, yeah. hi. hi. Hello. Oh. And he stole my line about the illuminating. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> about that later. Anyway, on behalf of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen, um, we would like to recognize you for your participation in our labor lecture series. So that's for oh, your lovely. office or home. And then also we'd like to make you an, a member of the library so you'll come back and visit again. Absolutely. And Thank again. You. Right. Thank again. You so much. And this is Meg Stanton, our program assistant, Hi. and we have a little she's going to give you a little memento oh. of tonight's lecture. <laughs> I think we all have seen this on the, on Facebook enough in the past. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, well thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very, very oh, yeah. much. It was, it, it, it was terrific. Uh, I want to invite you now to stay for some wine and cheese, and I'm sure uh, Jeff will be willing to answer a few more questions yeah, in an informal basis. Exactly. So thank you. And I just want to remind you, um, the final lecture in this series will be with Abe uh, Jacobs, and that is on, so I just remind myself, it's April, I think, 7th. 7th I think. Yes, I think it is the 7th. Yes, well done. Yeah. Very good. Well, Abe and I had to switch. He had, yeah. a, he had a gig tonight, so... Uh, <laughs> so I know when his, his was when I know when his is because I was supposed to do it. <laughs> yes, exactly. So he is April 7th and he will be talking about sound, sound design. And Abe is really described as he's the godfather of sound on Broadway. So it will be another fabulous talk. Again, many thanks to Jeff. Thank you all for coming out this evening. Thank you so yeah, much. My pleasure. Thank you.